Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Dr. Dan Olson to all of you. Um, Dan comes from Brigham Young University, where he's a computer science professor. And Dan's had a, an illustrious past that I won't go into in detail. I'll let him shine forth for you while he gives his talk. But I should say he's well known as an instigator and a leader in the field of HCI. He's gotten most of us onto various positions and boards in, in our professional community. He's written lots of wonderful papers. and. Um, is now moving into a new area, as you can see from his title, where he's trying to once again shake things up by bridging um, the gap between machine learning and HCI. So without further ado, I'll let Dan take it away. Uh, thank you, Mary. Uh, for those of you hiding in that corner over there, it might not be all that. You got it, Steve? OK. By the way, Travis, your slide is in here. Okay, I want to talk about interactive machine learning because uh, it's an area, as Mary mentioned, that we're into, but I'm, today I'm going to pose probably more questions than I'm going to provide answers, mainly because the questions are always more fun. So first question is why would we care about or be interested in interactive machine learning? And whenever I think about a research area in computer science, I always have to start at Moore's Law. As I regularly tell my students, if your idea is irrelevant because of Moore's Law, quit, stop, do not waste your time, go find something new to work on. Okay, and the thing we've got in HCI is we've got exponentially growing comp computation, exponentially growing memory, exponentially growing uh, pick your favorite value, except for human capacity. And no matter how hard we work in academics, we just haven't been able to make people that much better. We try. We've tried implants. No, we didn't. OK. One of the big things that concerns me is the amount of screen space that a human being can actually use. It's fixed. Your eye will not move any faster. And it will not consume any more pixels. Therefore, as all the other information we consume gets bigger, we have a problem compressing all of that onto the screen and doing something usable at the user interface. So the first item is direct manipulation will not scale. Your eyes will not let it scale, and particularly your hands will not let it scale. You can't see that much. You can't touch that much. And one of the things I believe is that one technique for getting this scale is machine learning. So if I do a little bit. Oh, they did give me a laser pointer. Do not look at laser with remaining eye. If I do a little bit down here on the screen, which gives me some examples out here in this world of data, I can then use machine learning to actually give me access to and leverage on a large amount of data. So that's sort of the general idea in this particular thing I'm looking at in terms of leverage is show me a little bit the computer will then help me do a lot. OK. The other part of Moore's Law, which we don't pay very much attention to, which in HCI is extremely important, is the exponential drop in cost. Because every time we get an exponential drop in cost for a fixed amount of computing, we empower a whole new set of interactive techniques and a whole new set of interactions. The big thing we do is it lets us push computing off of the desktop and into our world in all sorts of interesting new places. And we have no design tools. Visual Basic just won't cut it. It's nice for the screen. When you get out in the world, it doesn't help you. So these two problems, big data and little tiny devices, um, is what I'm going to talk about today. And I'm going to show you some ways that we found that machine learning can actually help. And then I want to talk about the process of what happens when people interact with the learning algorithms. OK, so first thing, I want to go through a set of examples. These are various pieces of work that we've done. 
and some things we learned out of them. And then I'm going to go on to some characteristics of this interactive process. When there's a human in the loop, what happens? And then there are some effects that I want to go into with some data here further on. So let's start here. Travis, this is your slide, your claim to fame. So we wanted to do laser pointer interaction. And the first thing is we've got to find the laser spot, which of course everybody knows is red, except for the people who have actually tried to do it, and they know it's not red. And it's annoying. And so you just take a graduate student, you throw them at it for two, three months, and something comes out. And it follows the spot pretty good. OK. In fact, there you are, Travis. Uh, this was the join and capture work, which is how do we follow the people? And how do we find where people are in the environment? Well, the answer is you get out your favorite image processing books. You take a graduate student. You throw the graduate student at it for two, three months. Magically out comes something that will track people. Of course, good enough to get a Kai paper, not necessarily good enough to work in the real world. Grumpy, 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 grumpy. <laughs> OK. We did another thing called light widgets. Uh, with light widgets, you mount cameras in the ceiling, multiple cameras, and you track skin. And by tracking skin, we can convert any surface in a room that's visible to two or more cameras into a remote control for a device. Of course, to make it work, you have to have a skin tracker. OK, so you take a graduate student. <laughs> you got the theme here. You take a graduate student. You take three months, and you get it working on all of the Caucasian people in the lab, <laughs> <laughs> which is not the same as the real world. But it works OK, and you publish the Kai paper, and all is good. OK. Now, we got really frustrated with this because you know, the cycle of and then you throw a graduate student at it for three months didn't seem like the most effective way to be designing new interactive techniques. Now, also having this sort of childlike approach to computing, it is all about the toys. Don't let them fool you. We developed this thing called image processing with crayons. First thing, we wanted to be able to design all of these things I just showed you in a few minutes rather than a few months. Our metaphor is you have crayons and you scribble on pictures. I love this. It's so easy to train people. You are now fully trained crayons. Per OK. In, in terms of image processing, as I'll show you in a minute, we can't use many of the machine learning algorithms because this is an interactive process. And the speed is just abominable. Nobody likes a user interface where you scribble, 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 wait overnight. Scribble, scribble, scribble. This is not interactive. Yeah, well, Moore's Law is a little slower than we were willing to wait for. One of the ways this works is we generate lots of features, and then we use a machine learning algorithm as a feature selector, as I'll show you here in a second. So we need video. OK, in this case, we're uh, doing the skin tracker. And we made two crayons, one for background, one for skin. OK, when he pushed that button, it is trained. That was the training time, not the classification time you watched. Classification time is about 15 frames per second. OK, in this case, we're getting training times, what was it, four or five seconds? Now, the process that he's going through here, which everybody goes through, we're going to talk about this, is as soon as they get feedback, they immediately start to correct whatever the machine learning was doing. You never have to explain this to anybody. They automatically do it. In fact, it's hard to make them not do it if you decide that's important. OK, a little cleanup on the knuckles. Looking a little scabby there. Of course, we've got the Tom Mitchell's machine learning book in the background there. And four minutes of magic occurs. You didn't really want to watch that for four minutes. OK, now when we flip through the images, now for some of you, you're a little upset because this looks like kind of a cruddy selection. For any of you that have actually tried to do this, 
This is much, 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 much better than anything we ever built by hand, taking those two and three months of graduate student. And except for the four minute interlude there, what you saw was real time. In fact, it's actually a little slower than real time because the screen capture for the recorder actually sucks up some of the cycles. Uh, it would work on a tablet PC. This one happened to be a plain old ordinary Dell. But yeah, it would work fine on a tablet PC. It depends. I mean, most of these we just do with a mouse. Okay. Well, there's, there's actually a whole bunch of stuff that I've just, I'm glossing over a whole bunch of image processing stuff. And we can talk if you want to about integral images. We got that from Bill Freeman, which is a really nice way to do really fast features in image space. So if you're doing image things, come talk to me. There's a bunch of really cool tricks that work really well. Okay. We also, being usual academics, we followed the money and DARPA had the money this month. So we decided to do robots. Now, being good economizers of effort, we have robots with crayons. So one of the things we're interested in is we're interested in steering robots and we're interested in increasing the neglect time. That is, I want to drive this robot and I want to increase the amount of time I can neglect it and pay attention to something else. Because if I'm completely devoted to driving the robot, unless I'm really interested in vicarious touring, this is not a very interesting task. So there's almost always something else I want to do. The other problem we have is unless you've been trained on most robots where you're looking through the camera and seeing what the robot sees, almost everybody when they walk through a doorway or drive through a doorway will drive through the doorway, will stop, will look and see what's available, and will turn and run directly into the door jam. Universally. We have to train you over and over not to do this. The reason is, as human beings, we've just developed out of habit of taking one or two steps past the door jam before we turn. But you have no sense of where your body is when you're in the robot. It has no relation. You, you lose track completely of what you're doing. OK. Now, the way people do is they remember that the door was there and they don't run into it. So what we needed was we needed a mechanism for our robot to decide what's in the world, what's safe, and what's not. The problem is it changes. So what's safe and what's not on the carpet in this room is very different than on the sidewalk, on the grass, in the parking lot with cars. So what we wanted is the ability to teach our robot what's safe and what's not in the situation we're in. So the actual training is part of the user interface. And here's how it works. In this situation, we want the robot to stay on the sidewalk. So, marking the sidewalk is safe. And the grass and people is unsafe. To robots, people are unsafe. And then tell the robot to drive forward. This is not a real fast robot. It's actually made out of old pieces of PVC. Notice that the classifier already does reasonably well at classifying the people as unsafe. There's a whole flock of features, There's 250 features we use. And the crayon one goes over it, that these are the types of features I'm looking for. The, the classifier now marks the snow as mostly unsafe. We tell the robot to move forward, and it is now able to avoid the snow. 
Okay, a couple of things to point out here. Number one, this classifier is actually not doing a marvelously great job at what is safe and what is not. So for example, it's said that this building up here is safe. And if you remember in the previous frame, the snowy mountain behind the people was safe. Well, it turns out that in this kind of an interface, it doesn't matter. And the reason it doesn't matter was because it was part of the interface and the human could say, it's OK, it's good enough. It's determining what it shouldn't run into and what not. And the fact that it didn't get it perfect doesn't matter in this situation. Now, in some situations, you can take this thing and put it down, and it will not get it at all. It just doesn't discriminate. And the user can see that because everything ends up being modeled, in which case they'll come over here on this side and use the manual driving interface. One of the things you get out of this is if the machine learning works, great. You can drive faster with less attention than you could before. If it doesn't, it's OK. You're no worse off than you were before. I think this is an important part of integrating learning into the interface because if I have to slow down or perform less effectively because of the learning, most people won't do it. They'll just say, forget it. I'm going to keep doing it the way I know how to do it. George? I'm not quite uh, off the hook there because you did waste some time trying to train it. Yeah, we did waste a little bit. Now. Um, I'm not going to show you all the videos, but we can take this and do just what you've seen here. Put it in a parking lot, don't run into the cars. Uh, put it in this room, don't run into the walls. What's your worst case scenario? What's like a typical scenario with brakes? Like, for example, would it be like if there was a concrete wall the same color as the. Yeah. That's kind so, of for example, if you had unfinished cement floors and unfinished cement walls, it would have a hard time saying. It turns out, in many cases, the lighting actually causes the differentiation that it picks up. Because the way the light reflects off a vertical surface and a horizontal surface is frequently different enough for it to pick up, but not always. Sometimes. If the time of day changes, that probably also affects your. Yeah. yeah. One of the other things, but one of the things that's the most important that I want to talk about in this particular interface is teaching the robot is part of the interface. It's not something that happens batch and offline. And it has to be fast enough to fit within that paradigm. You were saying you have about 200 classifiers, and I, I mean, features, features yeah. you, you, you work off of. I mean, there must be some, some classifier features that are very salient. It's just when it seems it can change. It's quite, I mean, when you're so in an entirely new environment, say you put the robot in the gym, right, where the, where the floor is green, right? I mean, at this point, when, do, when can you know to start to learn? Oh. As soon as it comes up, you just see it. It's just completely confused. And you just go right down here and say, clear classifier, and teach it the new situation. OK. How will the robot then know that this new situation occurs? Oh, the robot doesn't. The user does. Yeah, this is not autonomy. Okay. This is assisting the user in driving. Okay. I, have you done anything with trying to discover new features as well? Or you uh, a little bit. A little bit. But. OK. What I want to do is I've, I'm going to try to wrench you free of images for a minute, which I will be marginally successful at doing. Uh, because I want to talk about this interactive machine learning loop, which is what I'm really interested in. OK, so generalizing your mind to artifacts, speech, audio, sensor streams, images, video, break free of images. And the loop looks like this. OK, I have some user interface that's going to present artifacts, whatever they are, and I'm going to have a mechanism for labeling. In our image case, it was painted with crayons. I have labeled data, and I have a feature generator, and I get a machine learning algorithm, and I get some trained function, and I provide feedback to the user. OK, this is fundamental to the process I want to look at today. Now. One of the things that happens is most of the people, for example, that we want to drive a robot or people who want to do intelligent selection and images are not prepared to be feature generators. They're not prepared to write the code. And in fact, one of the things we found is that even our image processing friends are not very good at all at selecting by hand which features will work the best. It's very much a cut and try. 
So even people that are really good at it will say, well, I think a spot filter in the new, and it's wrong. OK? Almost none of our users have any skill at selecting an appropriate training algorithm. That part of the mechanism. So most of them are living in this loop right here. Now, having said that, with my HCI hat, what I'd really like is to tell you that you live in that loop and the world is all good. And, and that would be a lie. So going back to our image case, the features we use are basically areas of color. We use multi-scale and we use differences and uh, reciprocals of various features, which is how we end up with the explosion. So it turns out anything based exclusively on color will not distinguish grass from trees. If you want to distinguish grass from trees, what you need is you need something that gives you the frequency of the texture. Because that's the real big difference between trees. The texture down here is relatively fine. The texture up here is significantly larger. That's your best discriminator. We don't have a feature that does that. Now, this is just an example. Pick any example. I can find one that you don't have a feature that will discriminate. So then the question is, what do you do? Well, the answer that you do is you go find somebody to build more features, or you think about your problem differently. We go about 50% on which way it works. Many times we just think about the problem differently and we get something we can solve. OK. To make this work, your training algorithm runs in seconds, not days. So this eliminates support vector machines. It eliminates a lot of perceptrons. Uh, it eliminates um, neural networks. None of them will perform at these kind of speeds. I mean, if you put a big cluster behind it, maybe you might get there. But um, The ones we've been using that we find most effective are decision trees and naive bays. Those we can get to run at interactive speeds if we have the right feature set. What k nearest means? Uh, k nearest neighbor trains just fine, and this function is typically not fast enough. When you're trying to do 640 by 480 at 15 hertz, and that's, you know, many interactive applications are not quite that rate, but it's still k-means. k-means has really nice properties. Also, when you're generating hundreds of features, k-means isn't a feature selector, so you end up doing lots and lots of redundant junk. OK, the other thing is that the dominant part of this process is labeling. That is the time spent by the human being saying, this is what I want and this is what I don't want. That's where all the time gets consumed. The good news, one of the things you do is you find the wrong solution real fast, which is not a bad thing. Speaking of bad things. which is not a bad thing. Frequently, what will happen is we will try a problem. We will not be successful at training it. We will change our model of the problem. We'll try again. We'll change our model. But the thing is, this is happening in days cycle time rather than months of cycle time. So it really speeds up how fast you can get there. Uh, the other thing that happens is you end up exploring the problem space. And you get a much better understanding about what you can or cannot accomplish in this space if we get this loop going here. OK. Now, for those of you that like data, we're going to go dig down into something we call the feedback effect. So the first question is, I've got this thing right here which says we take our trained function and we show the user what it's doing. Now. If I don't need this part of the loop, if I can get rid of that, then I don't care how long this takes. It doesn't matter. Because I can just build a nice interface that lets people label really fast. And once they've labeled really fast, I throw it at my cluster and it goes away for a week or a month or whatever. I don't care. And eventually I get a trained function that I'm happy with. So. how quickly it's adapting, uh, then it's not going to be predictable. 
it's going to change behavior on you at some point. You're not going to understand why it or when it happened. Well, let me show you where we're going with this here. Okay. The first thing, which we talked about previously, is everybody with no training automatically corrects. Once they get the first round of feedback, they don't just label anywhere. They automatically go to what's wrong. Sort of like you felt about your parents. No matter what I do, they automatically go to what I did wrong. Okay, so here's what's going on when that happens. We have a two-dimensional feature space because it fits on the slide. Um, and we have some decision surface. Our user knows how to recognize the two classes, but has no idea where this fits in feature space. No clue. And our algorithm has no idea where the decision surface is at this point. Okay, so we give it some, a couple of training examples, and it learns a surface. It feeds back to us how it's doing on all of the data, and we look at it and say, these things were wrong. And so we give more training data. Okay, so it trains again, and we look at it and say, examples like this were wrong, and we do it again. And it trains again, and we give it more examples. Okay, what's happening here is it's naturally implicit in this feedback that the new training examples will collect around the true decision surface. It's implicit, it doesn't matter what training algorithm you're using. If you've got this, I see what you did and I correct you, I see what you did and I correct you, it automatically focuses. Now, for people that are familiar with machine learning, this behaves a lot like boosting, with one important difference. In the boosting algorithm, the set of data I have is fixed, and so what I tend to do is emphasize the things that were wrong, that are close to that struggling surface that sometimes has the effect of accentuating exactly the things that are noisy and wrong and you don't want to accentuate. In this, what it does is it actually swamps such data with appropriately labeled examples. So it doesn't have that same problem, but algorithmically, it behaves in much the same way. Okay, so with that piece of sort of understanding, it ought to reduce my effort because I'm focused around the decision surface. I'm getting the training examples right where I need them. Now I should point out, this works really well for margin classifiers like support vectors. It struggles on some other kind of classifiers that use statistical areas. Okay, so here's how we tried to decide, is this really going to reduce the effort? So, if you want to look at machine learning and you want to do it in an interactive situation, the one thing you don't want to do is run 10,000 tests. Mainly it's hard to find that many users. None of us have the patience to actually watch that many users do whatever it is they're going to do. So we start with simulations and we started with some artificial oracles. This is just for a given feature space. We randomly generated a predicate. We've got true fault. Let's see if we can learn it. So the first approach is you just randomly select training examples, you use them to train, and you match, them, match the resulting classifier against your oracle, how good did you do? Okay, and the more examples you get, the greater the asymptotic accuracy. The second one is, I train a classifier, and then I only select training examples from the places where the classifier is wrong, which is that correct technique. You run the simulations and it takes 15% less examples. Yay! The feedback effect works. Okay, now, does it work with real people? So what we did is we took 20 pictures and you get a graduate student and they color every pixel in all 20 pictures, which they really hate. Um, so what we have is a standard that is accurately classified every single pixel in the picture. Okay, and then we have two cases. One of them is users just paint with crayons, but we don't give them any feedback. So they just keep painting. 
Okay, the other one is we paint, classify, give them feedback, they correct, classify, feedback, correct, classify, feedback. Okay, now the question is, does it take us fewer training examples? And the answer is, no significant difference. Oh, we had several of them. One of them was get the bear out of the grass, find the skin. I can't remember, find the sky from the trees. We had a bunch of them. I guess I'm just asking because, like, as you said in the robot example, it doesn't have to be perfect to drive the robot. Right. Are you going, you're going, like you're going. What we're, what we're really trying to do here is we're really trying to study the process. Does this feedback loop actually translate? Now, so are you measuring the, the total number of different times that they sit down and... No, what we're measuring is how many training examples to get to a given level of accuracy. But in the first one, there's only one example if there's no feedback. So I'm a little, like in the oh, no, there's, there's plenty of examples. They're painting. They're generating examples like crazy. So you give them like multiple frames in a video or something? Yeah. Like that. Yeah, and just say color, color, color. I have a hypothesis as to why this doesn't show up. And that is, in our simulations, the problems were absolutely learnable. In many of our real situations, given the feature set, they're not completely learnable. So in many of them, you just can't get beyond 90% accuracy. It turns out that margin of uncertainty in the problem is about the same as the, un as the advantage we were getting from the feedback, and I believe it might be washed out, but I don't have any data. So we end up with this nasty thing that says, it should be good. It feels good. Okay, so being good academics, let's try a different problem. <laughs> okay, this is the problem of are we done yet? This is really important when people are training because the amount of things you label is where all your effort is and everybody wants to know, am I done yet? Okay, now before, remember we said that you really can't learn this problem. And the question is, is how does our innocent user who is not an expert in machine learning find out that I can't really learn this problem? Because sometimes it's I can't learn it and sometimes I just need to give it more training examples. Okay, and the key to that is estimating the accuracy of what we have so far and watching for when it plateaus. What we need is a good accuracy estimate. Okay, so we go to the machine learning book and it says, well, try a holdout set, which is take some of your data, set it aside, take your other data train, compare it against the held out data. And if you do this, you can do a K fold. And so you've got 10 different ways that you did this and you say, how good am I doing? It turns out to be rather slow, but. Now, so what we did is we took, in this case, this is from one image. We have a whole bunch of these, but you don't want to see all the slides. Okay, we took an image, and we know what the true answer is. And across the bottom here are generations of classifiers. So each one of these is about 500 new pixels being painted. So the user painted, and we got an accuracy. This is the actual comparison of our classifier to the true gold standard. Okay, so that's how well we are actually doing as this user is training. This is what K-fold and holdout set says we're doing, which is 100% almost from the beginning. The holdout set and the cross-validation immediately says you're perfect, it's great, which of course is not true. Okay, the problem is in the user interface. Now, we tried a different estimate, which is one of the things I want to show you here. So it says, I have a set with I training examples in it, and I build a classifier. And then, let's say I get 500 more training examples from my user, and in particular, they're examples that are correcting the earlier classifier. That's an important part of this. And I build a new classifier, and I say, how much do they disagree on my unlabeled data on images the user hasn't looked at yet? 
Okay, and this is important. And that how much they disagree is my estimate of the error. Okay, we have two versions of this algorithm. They're in the yellow and the purple and they track on almost all, I show you bunches and bunches of data here. They track the actual actuary accuracy very closely. Now, let's look at why. We actually have a why for this. Cross-validation. The user right here was stroking across the knuckles because there were scabby spots there. If you look at, basically we're getting a training example for every pixel. And if I'm doing, let's say, a 4x4 four four brush, what I'm getting is 16 training examples that are almost identical because they're from a similar part of the image. Okay? Well, if every 16 examples are almost identical and I do a tenfold cross validation, all of my cross validations are virtually identical and I will show no difference. It's the problem is actually in the way the user interface works and in the way it collects data. By collecting lots of self-similar data, it actually completely defeats the standard accuracy estimate. Okay. One of the effects, this is uh, an interpretation of why the comparison, the incremental comparison works. One of the effects people have is they have what we call training myopia. So I give you 100 images to start to train on and at least 60% of the subjects will grab the first three images and will paint them in exquisite detail, correcting, 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 trying to get them right. Okay? Everybody in some form or another tends to focus themselves in one area. So, we've got this labeled training data and we've generated a classifier that divides up the space like this. And our user gives us a new training example and we generate a new classifier and it looks like this. What happens to the classifiers is if you've been focused in a small area, the classifier in the areas you're not focused in tends to whip around wildly. There's no data out there to pin it down, so it just extrapolates in whatever way it feels. And that generates a large area of disagreement. And it turns out that's a very good predictor of your overall error. So if you start doing data out here, we start to pin this down, and your overall accuracy starts to get very good. Okay, we incorporated that into an interface. What this one does is it says you started to classify and then we've run this check all the unlabeled data and we're showing you the places where there's the most confusion with these little uh, thermometers here. And we've actually showed you in this image where we have the most confusion. And by focusing your attention there, we eliminate this myopia problem because we force you to look at places where we're just really uncertain what's going on. Okay, so on the are we done yet, with the feedback effect, we actually have quite a good estimate that is robust in the presence of how users behave. Now, one of the things I want to point out is, you know, my, my traditional machine learning friends would immediately tell me, why are you generating this really stinky, statistically erroneous errors for us? generate good statistically appropriate data. Well, most of our users do not like to be modified. They want to do what they want to do. And we've trained them for years and years and years that the purpose of a computer is to adapt to them, not the other way around. So what we're really interested in is what are the techniques that are robust in the presence of how people actually behave as opposed to the mathematics we'd like them to conform to. Okay, so back to our question. Does feedback matter? Maybe. Maybe. We have, a, we have some theory and some data that points both ways. It's really mixed at this point. Okay. Now what I want to do to wrap up here is I want to go look at this process of if we get people in the loop with our machine learning, what are the interesting things we can do? So one of the first ones is, 
let's get out of images and into a lot of other artifacts. There's text classification. There are videos, so example, um, these two examples right here I drew from Scott Hudson's work on interruptibility. Uh, I know whether or not you're interrupted by, are there multiple people in the room with you? And is anybody talking? Okay, well if I have a camera and I have a microphone, I'd like to have a talking sensor and a multiple people in the room sensor. And I would like not to spend months and months and months building this. Okay, these are examples of where an interactive machine learning tool would help. Sensor streams. Uh, Ken, I took these first two from you. So I've got accelerometers. Almost nobody but Ken knows how to look at an accelerometer plot and say, oh yeah, there it is. The rest of the world just says, they shook it. Please detect that. They bumped them together. Please detect that. Um, these are the, back up. These are the kinds of things we would like to build into a design system. Desney's been working on, I've got brain waves, they come out of the machine, they look horrendous, I want to get something out of it. Okay, we're very interested in, if I'm going to use lots of sensors that sense things that people are doing in the environment, what's my design tool that lets me translate sensed data into actions in the interface? Okay. One of the other things is, in the image case that we've been working with, you can generate hundreds of thousands of training examples in a very few minutes. It generates training examples very, very fast. Not all interactive artifacts behave like that. So if you wanted to text classify documents, for example, you have to read them. You don't read multiples of documents per second. You take multiples of minutes per document. Um, if you're trying to label video, it can be very slow labeling video because basically you're watching until the event wants to occur. You might be able to accelerate that, but compared to the, to compared to the uh, image situation, if this becomes much more expensive than our example, then does that feedback effect start to appear earlier because we have smaller and smaller generations of data, train, classify, data, train, classify. And does the effect then start to appear much more quickly and more effectively? And the answer is we don't know. OK. We also have the examples I've been giving you are of this form, which says a user selecting and an algorithm classifying are fundamentally the same thing. The difference is in the agent that performed this classifying act. One of the things, if you think about that, then that allows you to say any part of any user interface that has the power to select things, has the power to produce training data, which can then be given to an algorithm, which can then automatically select things in your behalf. And that's not just images. That's pick your user interface. It applies. Another possibility is I have artifacts, I take things out of them, and I put them into a structure. If I take things out and put them into a structure, each location that I put them is a class, and the place I took them from is the data to be learned. If I can learn this transformation, then I can automate this process of take it out of that artifact and put it in this structure for me. I can learn a whole bunch of extraction tasks. Similarity metrics. This one's one of my favorite. It's Sesame Street learning. You put three things on the screen and say, one of these things is not like the other, with or without music, as you choose. Uh, what that allows you to do is that allows you to learn how things are similar or dissimilar for a particular problem. This is really important if you want to reduce the number of features for a nearest neighbor algorithm. If I can do a metric like this, throw away 85% of my features as not being important, now I've got something that'll give me some leverage on a nearest neighbor or a support vector machine or something else of that nature. Um, what I need is an interface that lets me train that for my particular problem. 
Uh, folders, this is very close to that one. Every time I take something and put it in folders, if I'm the least bit principled about it, that's a classifying act. It can be learned. Hints. We did a system in speech. This was in the speech domain. We called it query by critique. Okay, the problem is this. I have a big list of data of things with attributes. The examples we used were apartments that I would like to rent or cars that I would like to buy. Okay, they're in a big list. Now, if you have 200 cars for sale and you call up on your spoken language interface and it proceeds to read you the want ads for all 200 cars, you are exceedingly distressed. Okay. Now, we could just take a classifier approach to this saying, no, I don't like that. Yes, I like that one. Well, this is also exceedingly slow. So what we had is an interface that would say, they would read you some attributes about the car and you could say things like, the price is too high. Okay, what you've done by saying that is identified some attribute of what you just heard that is wrong and some indication about what would be more appropriate. Turns out with this interface, converges very quickly from large lists to the car or apartment that you're actually looking for. It also has a nice property that if you change your mind along the way, think about a shopping activity. You go into a store, you're looking for something in particular, they don't exactly have it, and without having a discussion with anybody, you change your mind about what you will accept based on what's available. Okay, this automatically handles that kind of drifting. But the key is, is that in the user interface, we're getting hints from the user about what is important and what is not. This really accelerates the learning a lot. Okay, one of the things I think is important is it has to integrate with what I'm already doing. If there's this huge energy hump to teach the computer what to do, most people will not cross it. The set of people who can program customization features into their interface is much, much larger than the set of people who actually do. And it has to do with this energy hump of how much, how much do I have to stop my work to teach you how to do my work? Or if I just do my work and you watch me and then help me, I will be happy. Here's one that we did. Uh, this, is a, this is a system called screen crayons. We're really into the crayons metaphor lately. Um, what it does, is it's a note taking system. And you have a crayon for every kind of topic that you're currently interested in. And if anything appears on the screen related to that topic, you grab your crayon and you just color over the parts that you're interested in. And it automatically finds and highlights and stores the images away so that you can find them again. But the one thing we did with this was we went, and since we're doing, this is actually based on screen captures. So we take these regions that you've selected and we OCR them. The nice thing about OCRing screen captures is there's no noise. You just compare what font you see to the fonts that are in your machine. It's very nice. Cheat like crazy. One of my favorite ways to do user interfaces. Um, and you take the words for a particular topic, which is associated with a crayon, you take all those words and you use that to perform a Google search. Well, we've got some data that says, pick your topic, perform a Google search, and then tell us which of the pages you find you like. Then, out of all those pages, color the parts that, you, that were most important to you, and then what we did is take what you colored and said, okay, we will go process a Google search and filter it based on the words you said were important, and then we'll have you rank how well that result works for you. Significantly better, because what we're doing is we're taking your work, making notes about your topic, and getting much more information from you about what's important. For your information retrieval folks, it's very close to relevance feedback, very close to that algorithm. But 
It's blended into the natural work of note taking. I watched you and I was able to help you and do better than you did on your own. Collaboration. Let's suppose there are a bunch of people labeling on this problem. Now the first thing we can do is say we want everybody to agree very carefully about what the labels mean. This is problematic. Mainly it takes a long time for everybody to agree and they don't necessarily agree, they just nod their head at each other. But we don't necessarily think that we care. Okay? Because we think there's a possibility that says if we have these three people labeling artifacts in the neighborhood of a problem, the fact that they're coming at it from different directions may actually help us. Because what we might get is we might get three or four or n different classifiers trained from different aspects of the problem such that an ensemble of what there is will be much more effective than any one of them individually because they implicitly approach the problem from a different direction. We don't have any data on this, but it's a, it's a, it has real potential, we believe. One of the other ones is if people have been training and training and training and releasing classifiers into a common repository, those classifiers become new features. So now we have a possibility of when I approach my problem, I can build on the work that other people have done even though I don't know they did it and even though I have no idea whether or not it applies. The implicit feature selection automatically pulls them out. How do you keep your data clean? What? How do you keep someone from saying, I, I really want to go opposite today? Ah, the, an the answer is, the answer is so, and it's, it's a good question. What happens if people are just doing cruddy training? Well, the only thing that matters in this approach is, is it helping me get my job done? That's the only thing that matters. If it is, I don't care what their motivations were. And if it isn't, the algorithm throws it away and doesn't use it as a feature. I mean, that's, that's interesting. Uh, you could say, like, the user might be overcompensating, right, or undercompensating, right, or just changing their mind or oscillating around his or her response. Now, I think the user interface, since the user, the user is involved, the user interface would have to indicate that in some form. I mean, is the user overcompensating because the, cl the classifier is going off in the wrong direction, or is the user overcompensating because they are just, you know, maybe somewhat too expressive today, right? And, and they themselves are overcompensating. So what do you mean by overcompensating? Well, say, say, I mean, you know, say, say the user sees the robot is going off in the wrong direction, the user starts to circle more, like, it starts mm -hmm. getting really worried and it's painting in more and more areas, cutting into just still labeling suddenly um, okay. items, right? I mean, this, this could happen. I, I know people like that, right? The, the <laughs> right? I mean, you know, your father example would work, your parents example would work, right? And you just want to make sure everything's good, right? So at this point, right, you might be overcoming today because the algorithm is too sensitive or maybe the user is too sensitive. Yes, and do we? I, I can't give you any clue as to which of those will occur. Yeah, yeah. I mean that's that's a that's an, it's, it's a very important question of, you know, when, I mean it's like a lot of other feedback loops as most engineers and controls will tell you. If you've got a feedback loop with latency, you can produce oscillation. You know, does those kind of degenerate behaviors occur? Don't know. There's a potential. There's definitely a potential. Well, when it's, yeah, when it's, well, and then you say, okay, if we do see that this regularly happens, then how would we compensate for it in the user interface? And when you've got the answer, let's publish that Kai paper. Okay. So, we have itty bitty screen. Big universe, itty bitty living space. Um, we want to leverage what the user can express. There is not enough human attention to get at all the information that we potentially have available. We want to show it what we want and have something help us. And we want it to watch what we do and help us implicitly where possible. 
it, it strikes me at least that last group annotation sort of thing was kind of like a sort of malicious or technorotic uh -huh. out the machine learning. You're just, the masses of people are sort of behaving as this classifier, essentially. Yes. The one thing um, when you were showing some of the evaluations that I was wondering about was um, you showed that you could sort of reduce the amount of training samples that you need in order to achieve the same kind of accuracy. Well, have you compared that against doing active learning where you, instead of transcribing everything, right, instead of labeling everything, right, you try and find those areas by some measure of confidence for which you don't need to train on anymore. You find those areas that you do need to train on more. And then so you selectively, you know, decide what you're going to be training on in the future. And people have shown that that active learning for uh, for at least speech, I, I don't know about Im image processing, can reduce the, uh, the amount of uh, labeling that's necessary dramatically. Yeah, it turns out that that comparison that I showed you with thermometers, that actually is a variant of active learning. It's a variant of the query by committee technique. It does have standard query by committee in the case where you have lots of self-similar examples, suffers the same problem that the K-fold does. But if you use intergenerational committees that where you have the uh, correction in between, what you get is you get this nice spread in the two classifiers, and it focuses you right on those, exactly on those areas. Yeah, the active learning approach, I, I didn't mention that, but that, that process of comparing generations of classifiers is drawn right out of the active learning literature. You didn't say much about the uh, feature generators, sort of where all these features come from, where each problem domain. OK. Um, in the speech domain, it was easy. It was just words. That was. In the image domain, we use integral images. Are you familiar with? So we use integral images, which allows us to have um, uh, area features in constant time which turns out to be really important in a lot of the situations. And then we build combinations of those. So you take a little one minus a big one, and you get a spot filter. You take two side by side, and you get an edge filter. So what we can do is we can simulate a lot of the spot, edge, and those kind of filters at multiple scales. Is there any reason to think? your particular kind of task, like the robot task, if that's a good set of features, or it's just ones that you knew could be computed fast because integral images? Well, number one, they, yeah, we did cheat because we knew we could compute them fast. And number two, they work in a large number of situations. We actually built some texture features using the classical approach. They're way slow, and they made no difference. Okay. There are places where textures work, and we think there's a variant of integral images. There's the integral of the square of the difference that pulls out a lot of edginess, and we think we can get a really fast pseudo texture fil features that might do us some good there. Andy? Do you think users are, are going to be able to learn concepts like uh, overfitting and generalization? I mean, this, this seems to me like some level users are going to expect more and more performance. Well, the algorithms we've been using don't generally exhibit an overfitting problem. And part of it is because we've got the, the continuous feedback to the user, the users um, uh, is it just because the set of images is closed? Partly. Okay. Um, and partly if you get large amounts of data and you're continually pushing people out to look at things that are dissimilar to what they've been labeling, which is what the, uh, the one algorithm implicitly does, you tend to force people out into the entire, because in some sense, if you actually enumerated everything around the decision surface, this is not a bad thing. This says, I've got it. And so the question is when, you know, when the user gets a new image, the performance is pretty on it. Well, at some point you have to confront this, the, the problem that that doesn't scale, right? Yeah. The, well, the big thing, one of the things that I didn't spend a lot of time on here is um, the big assumption is did you collect enough raw data? Okay, not necessarily labeled data because we can help you get to the right places in the data you have. Um, so if you wanted to do your people in the room detector and the only data you collected is from your office, 
we can't help you. I mean, you put it in Mary's office, it's not going to work. Right, so it'll be interesting, like you're eventually going to come to a point where they're going to label something new, and the thing that they labeled two months ago actually breaks. Um, that depends on how much data you have. It depends on how much data you have. In the images, whatever you labeled before is not going to seriously break because you've got so much data. That's the nice thing about the image ones is we can, we can very rapidly generate hundreds of thousands of training examples. So that tends to hold the decision surface from wandering a lot. So are you saying that if we have enough data, let's say, let's keep it small to the earth, that if we have enough pictures and data and people who actually color and make it a, um, a finite set of data, that we wouldn't have to turn into any more data? We just have to work on algorithms to pull those data points and match them to what the people are saying. Well, it depends on what your problems are. I'm just yeah. to the vision. Well, no, but it depends on what it is you're trying to get the vision to do. Okay? If you're trying to get the vision to find bright purple, bright orange Microsoft cups in anywhere in a Microsoft building, that's not a real hard problem to do. And it won't take me a lot of data before I can get really, really accurate and it will almost never fail as long as the lights are on. What if I'm trying to get Microsoft cups in China? You've got to give me some data from China. But if I, yeah, that's my point. Yeah. But if I give you enough. You well, it's just like any problem. You know, if, if, you've, if you've solved it for what you know, you've solved it for what you know. Have you solved it for what you don't know? Maybe. But that's the same is true if you hand code it. How much data would you need to do that? Depends on the problem. I mean, there, there, is, there is no substitute for thinking hard about your problem. One of the big things, this doesn't obviate thinking hard about the problem. For a lot of users, it lets them focus on their problem rather than on the code or the mathematics related to their problem, which for a lot of users is really important. So um, if I understood you correctly, you were saying that you're giving real-time feedback as you go, but there's also a sense of was the mission completed or not at the end. Is that correct? Is there, is there a final yes, no, you did it right or not? Well, one of the things we're doing with the accuracy estimate is we're telling you this is how good we think you're doing. Now, well, if at no, some no, point it stops getting better. No, what I mean is, yeah, yeah so me, the human, I want to tell you, okay, yeah, you made it on this route, but I'm going to give you a judgment of how well you did. And so that time you made it, and I'll give you a 60, and this time I'll give you a 100. Is there a way to give the machine a final score at the end to assess overall quality and then have it build a model of of which combinations of things end up with a total better set of quality? Okay, I think you're. I think yeah. I think you're trying to. Uh, I think you're trying to do a different kind of training problems than the one we worked on. Okay. Um, and the answer. The, the answer would be yes because you know if there's a function and I can measure your deviation from it, and you've got the right set of features, you can learn it. Um, how long will it take? And, one of the things you're after, one of the things that we think helps is if I can watch my accuracy, is it a trustworthy estimate of the accuracy? That's important. Hopefully it's a conservative estimate. That is, it doesn't claim to be more accurate than it truly is. And if it starts to level out, I just forgot to say, you know, it's not getting better than 90%. I need more features. I need a different way of looking at this problem. I'm just not getting there. So the way I understand uh, what you do here is that the feedback actually allows uh, the algorithm to sort of take additional data. Right? Mm -hmm. And then you just, uh, you know, you do the classification. So there's no feedback for the feature generated at the moment. Yeah. And I thought this could be quite important. Yes, there is. Is that uh, the reason? Now, um, you ja know. James Fogarty at CMU has worked on uh, the ability to generate new features out of a space of features. And he's gotten a lot of mileage out of that. So what he'll do is you'll be in an interactive loop like this, and then you'll go offline, and it'll just churn overnight, generating lots and lots and lots of feature combinations um, on that data. And you come back in the morning, and now you've got a better set of features to start from. And he's gotten a lot of, he's gotten a lot of good things out of that in that he starts out, and he's actually relatively stinky and if he lets it churn away for a while he starts getting a set of features that starts 
performing quite well. So there is that possibility of step out of the loop, let the computer spend three days, and then start interacting with it again. But at that time, you still have to know what the feature is based on how additional data you get from the right? James takes the brute force approach, which is generate all the ones that look interesting and see if it got better. But there is a concept, yeah, when we do speech, uh, you know, research, we have this uh, recently, you know, many people are actually thinking of this. If you know roughly what class of sound you have, you will have much more you know, detailed feature mm -hmm. compared to if you don't know, you know, right. roughly what the broadcast is. So this is similar to the kind of problem you have, right? So if the user, or if the feedback actually, you know, the user may provide additional data, the data to the system. And then if there's a general uh, broad category, then the feature component will be made much, much simpler. Then if you don't know at all what's going to happen. Yeah, I think that's true. That's probably similar to the type of yeah. to read, to read that, 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 that one. How about we close and unchain the board ones from their chairs so that they can stop being polite and answer the questions.